Hello, um, everyone, and welcome to the first of our Matter to Life discussions. Um, this one is focused on microfluidics. I'm delighted to be joined by three of our Matter to Life fellows, um, Professor Katrina Landfester, Professor Sarah Kester, and Professor Joachim Reidler. Um, and I'm Anne Pawsey, I'm one of the coordinators of the school in Göttingen. Um, the format of today is that um, Professor Landfester will give us an introduction to the topic. We'll then have two talks from uh, Professor Kirsten and Professor Redler, and then you'll have the opportunity to answer, ask questions. Um, what we recommend you do is um, at the bottom of your screen, there is a thing with two little speech bubbles. It will either say Q and A or F and A, or potentially something else, depending on what language your Zoom is in. Um, type your questions in there as they come up and we can take them during the discussion section. Um, so please type them in there because that means everybody can see them. Um, if you type them in the chat, they have a tendency to get slightly lost. You can also upvote other people's questions if you think they're particularly interesting. So press plus and uh, we'll take the ones that people think are more interesting first. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Professor Lanvester um, to start this first Matter to Life discussion. Yeah, thank you very much and uh, for the kind introduction. Yeah, so it's a new format. Therefore, I'm really curious to see how it works out. Um, I will start to give first a presentation in general about uh, microfluidics, uh, the pro and cons. Um, and then I will give just a little bit of more detailed uh, things what we we are doing in the lab right now before I then hand over to Zara and Joachim uh, for their um, contributions. So let's start. Okay, and now I have to change that. Okay, so now it should work, I hope. Yeah, so Let's go for, for the really a fast introduction into uh, microfluidics. So in general, uh, microfluidics is that you can control flow of two immiscible fluids through a micron chain channel. That is what we want to do. So, and usually what we start with is that we have here an inner fluid with a capillary, which is here going inside um, the collection tube. We have the middle fluid and we have the outer fluid. And I think we're having a small issue with Professor Lanfester's internet yeah. connection. I, that's right, I don't hear her anymore. No, she appears to have dropped out. We're very sorry, this is a new format. We obviously invited gremlins. Sarah, may I hand over to you? You can start setting up your sharing of your screen. Okay. Um, so Excellent. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Sarah Kirster, who is now going to provide um, an introduction to microfluidics in cellular biophysics. Um, there may be things that aren't answered, which we can come back to once Professor Landfester rejoins us. Um, so thank you very much. And over to you, Sarah. Yeah, thank you very much, Anne. Um, I hope the same thing doesn't happen to me. We will see. Um, yeah, as, as Anne already announced, um, our work, uh, our group works in cellular biophysics and we use microfluidics as one tool among many. And I would like to show you just a few examples uh, from our past and present research where we use this tool. And I would also like to kind of briefly mention why we use it in each case. And actually the first example I want to show you is, is similar to what Katarina was starting with and that's the microfluidics of, of droplets using droplets as tiny compartments where we indeed have um, fluids that are not miscible. So for example, aqueous solutions here and oil coming from the side. And then when we um, put them together on a slightly complex device, which we fabricate, fabricate in our lab, then we can actually make these little droplets. And uh, I just want to show you a movie so you can see this. So these droplets are basically produced further upstream. And then we have these so-called parking lots where we can put the droplets in and we can yeah, park them there. And then we combine this microfluidics device with microscopy. And in this particular case, we put protein networks in the droplets so we can observe them over time. And so in this particular example, the microfluidics is used as a tool to produce picoliter 
compartments as small test tubes. So in, instead of using Eppendorf tubes, tubes or even larger um, vials, we use these small droplets. And um, let me show you one result here and I have to start these movies manually. So here's a network in a droplet and this is uh, in this case, an intermediate filament protein with just um, monovalent ions. And what you can see is that it fluctuates around but the network is not really changing over time. And when we instead add uh, magnesium chloride here, this is a divalent ions and the proteins are negatively charged, then um, we see over time that the uh, protein strongly aggregates and we get these clusters here. So this whole movie is eight minutes in real time. So this is a really fast pro process. And now using the uh, microfluidics, what we can actually do is we can do combinatorics because what we did on the device that I showed you on the slide before is we filled each droplet with a different concentration of magnesium. And then going through these, these rows of droplets, we have lots of different experiments on one chip. And so that makes this very efficient and we can compare the different conditions on this microfluidic chip. So that was the first example, and, and I'm sure that uh, Katarina will come back to this droplet microfluidics when she presents uh, afterwards. Um, but we also have other applications. So here is an example where we use laminar flow for controlled environments. So in microfluidics, we typically have laminar flow, meaning we have no um, turbulence, and we can use that very well in our experiments. So this is a complicated setup that we have in our lab, and it combines optical traps. You can see that with these red cones here. And with these optical traps, we can we can capture small beads, um, as shown here. We also have a fluorescence microscope, a confocal microscope here, so we can see what's going on, which is important for the visualization of the biological system that we are studying. And then comes the microfluidic chip here, which we use as a controlled sample environment. And you see that we have several inlets here, and they all flow in parallel. So when you look at this sketch here, we have these dashed lines that are not really channel walls, but they really, as a guide to the eye, divide this channel into several sub-channels. And since it's laminar flow, they wouldn't mix immediately as in a turbulent, like a coffee mug or something this would happen, but it would only go by diffusion. And this means that we can separate the beads that we want to trap here, some filaments that we want to attach to the beads, and some empty channel that we can use for the measurements. And you see this here. So we first use the optical traps to get the beads. Then we bind the filaments to the beads. And then we go to an empty channel so we can do the measurement without disturbance. And what you see here is a real confocal movie where we have the beads and some kind of junk here. We want really just one filament. And that takes a while until we really have a nice um, setting here. So this is the this is situation that we want. We have one filament between the beads. And with the optical traps now, we can extend the bead and we can relax it again and we can study the forces that we need to extend the bead. So in this case, the microfluidics is used for controlled sample environments. And um, how, can, how can we use this now? So here's a collaborative work um, that was done together with two other fellows, um, Stefan Klump and Andreas Janshoff, and the PhD student who did all the work, and I think she's also in the audience, was Anna Schepers, who is now basically um, in our group for the last three days and off to Oxford for her um, postdoc, which is really exciting. And what Anna did is she really used this ability to change the environment, because in this um, first example here, she changed the buffer conditions. In the second, um, like the salt conditions. In the second example, she changed the pH conditions of the buffer. And by that, she could really tune the mechanical properties of the filament. You can see that because here we plot how much force we need to extend the filament a certain amount. And you can see that the curves look different, and that's very much in line with the changes in the buffer. And this is how we can really precisely tune the environment around our filaments here. And I brought one third example. This is um, about um, using microfluidics as a controlled shear flow. And here we studied cells that are actually exposed to shear flow in their natural environment, and that's blood platelets. Blood platelets are the smallest cells in your body. They are only about two microns in size when they're um, floating around in your bloodstream. And when there's a wound, what they do is they, they attach to that, that wounded side, they spread out, they form a blood clot, and they contract. And that's, of course, highly interesting from a physics point of view. 
So um, here's actually a movie where you can see this process of the spreading, watch this platelet, for example, spreads out and then they become very large, they form this laminopodium. And so now we wanted to understand how the forces in the platelet develop when they are not just on a surface, but inside um, a, a shear flow. And um, what we did is we combined a very common technique to measure forces and that's traction force microscopy. And that's done with one of the experts in this technique, another fellow of the school, Ulrich Schwarz. Um, we combined this traction force microscopy with microfluidics, here's the inflow, the outflow. And then we watched the um, cells while in the flow contracting. And here's an example of such a contracting. Oops, this is not what I meant. Maybe I have to start this manually again. Yes. So here you see the force field developing. And it's, interestingly, we see these force hotspots, certain regions, which is um, a feature that we see all the time for these, for these kind of cells. And when we analyze our force fields, what we, what we um, realize is that in low shear, the uh, orientation of the force field is um, yeah, kind of random, but when it's at higher shear, then the contraction is perpendicular to the flow. So this is what we learned from these experiments. So three examples. In one example, I showed you that we use microfluidics for small compartments. In the second one, we use it to define our sample environment very precisely. And in the third one, I showed you how we use it to um, yeah, expose the cells to controlled shear flow. And with this, I'm at the end of my presentation. I would like to thank, of course, my great research group, all the funding we get, and our collaborators. Um, I thank you for listening. And um, if you're interested, come by and learn more about this and join our group if you like to. Thank you very much. OK, thank you, Zara. So sorry for uh, I was last kicked out. Um, and I think the last should um, now resume to my uh, introductory lecture because I think we'll go back to all the questions answered, so the, to all the questions uh, at the very end, right? So, and uh, otherwise uh, I think it's uh, too complex now. Okay, so let's um, start, restart to uh, share my screen again, um, and uh, that we can move forward now. So, what I just started that we have the inner fluid, the middle fluid, and the outer fluid in order to get then uh, droplets of high reproducibility and one droplet at a time and then afterwards another droplet and so on. So that means if we have nice capillaries, we can really by adjusting the flow and by uh, adjusting the diameter of the capillaries, we can produce, as you can see here, very nice droplets of different sizes. Um, we can have, uh, as you can see here, a very defined drop, the diameter. And if we change now the inner fluid, that the inner fluid already has uh, droplets in there, then we can have droplets in droplets. So that means we can choose here whether we want to have one, two, three droplets, how large the droplets inside the droplets should be. So therefore, we have here multiple emulsions with a great um, loading efficiency and we can make the emulsions as sophisticated as possible. And you already have seen some um, nice ideas in uh, the talk of Sarah. So what I just showed you uh, was that we, in the beginning, many people use glass capillaries, but what is still much better is to use now uh, PDMS ships, that means um, that is uh, based on silicone, and we can start here to make our own uh, ships um, as uh, we want to have them to decide. So we start with a master mold, then we um, pour the PDMS on top of it, can uh, then just um, cross-link it. We can then release the PDMS replica, that is here the blue thing what we have, can, for example, drill our inlets here. And then we have, of course, to connect it to a glass um, surface. Therefore, in order to activate that, in order to make it fitting, we use plasma treating in most cases to um, uh, link them together. And we have then the possibility to have uh, here our device uh, to our wish. So the advantages are here that we have um, unlimited design possibilities. We just design it on the computer. 
we can replicate that many times. Once we have our master mold, we just replicate that uh, every day or uh, whatever, however we want to have that. We have the soft material, which is easy to ma manipulate. And of course, it does not break as easily as glass capillaries. And we have here a high uh, fabrication reproducibility. So if we ask, whether there isn't disadvantage. Of course, there are also disadvantages. In this case, you cannot use any kind of organic solvent. Uh, for example, toluene or um, THF uh, does not work with a PDMS. But as a positive thing, so you have the uh, ship that you can just use. Here we printed out uh, 52 ships with different designs. We just cut them off and can use every day uh, a new ship and just connect it to the pumps um, with a PDM, uh, PDFE tubes. So very easy uh, to, to do so. And then we have our ships, as you can see here. And you see the same design as I showed uh, previously the inner fluid, the middle fluid, and the outer fluid, where, so the bubbles just say where they come in, um, the fluids. And then we have here junction one and junction two. And you can see here that we have here in two possibilities. This is junction one, this is junction two, where we can create our droplets. And here we have the uh, second possibility to make the uh, droplets more and more complex in order to form our, um, double emulsions. So that means we have now the possibility, for example, also to, to use here the uh, middle fluid in order, first of all, to get them involved. Uh, so wrapped here uh, around the um, droplets here. But in this case, this is the organic, usually the organic phase with, for example, surfactants in it. It might either de-wet uh, if it's an organic uh, solvent, directly devet, or it can just be extracted to our wish if we want, for example, to have uh, giant vesicles, for example. So, and this is a little bit what maybe we can discuss later on a little bit more in detail that we have as a disadvantage an exact control over the size of the droplets. Usually they are quite monodispersed. dispersed. We have an excellent encapsulation efficiency. We have a, a great, um, a, a complex mixture of the um, water soluble and water dispersible component that can be encapsulated. And we can uh, design the, PDMX, uh, the PDMS ships by a computer modeling and photolithography to our wish. So that is of course very nice and uh, very positive. Of course, there are also negative things if we want to uh, discuss also negative things because of course we need a special equipment um, in order so it's at least it's highly recommended to have a high speed camera precision pumps it's necessary and so on but um, we also have here the uh, glass capillary based microfluidics uh, is hard to master capillaries are fra fragile so here it's much better to use a PDMS even so what I already mentioned, we cannot use any kind of solvents in there. Um, although the number of droplets for research can be high enough, of course, production at a very high scale, so in a ton scale or so, uh, is not easily possible. So because we always have small volumes and the removal of the organic uh, phase may be inefficient. So let's Go directly then after this short introduction, which was really meant to be short, to the microfluidics we are doing. So inside here, um, the Max Planck Institute for Polymer Research in order to assemble um, cell-like bioreactors. So the idea is that we create large uh, vesicles, polymer vesicles, and inside this uh, large vesicles, we have small compartments, like in a cell where we have a large cell uh, structure and inside we have little compartments. And as we have an artificial cell, we might have then a programmable function and behavior. So what kind of um, uh, polymers do we use for the large uh, compartment? We need to have something what is, as in the case of the liposomes, hydrophobic and hydrophilic. 
That means here in the liposomes, we have a hydrophobic part and the hydrophilic part. But in the polymers, we have, for example, the polybutadiene and the polyethylene oxide, PEC or PO. And then we can form the large polymerosomes in the range of uh, a cell like several micrometers. So how are we doing that? <coughs> Again, so here we can use um, the microfluidics as I just showed to you that we create here the um, droplets where the, um, the polymer is just located at the outside of the droplets. Um, we get here in this case, because we are working with polymers, robust compartments, we can tune the membrane chemistry um, to our wish because we just change the polymer and then we have the possibility to change the membrane um, permeability. We can change the size, so preferably between uh, 20 and 80 micrometers. And in all cases, we have a high encapsulation efficiency. What we need in this case is we need to remove here the um, middle fluid by a oil removal or a de-wetting process. And in this case, we can get then a, a very nice encapsulation um, of either hydrophilic components, which are then entirely in the core of the uh, vesicles, or we can, uh, and, uh, so we can just embed hydrophobic components in the, um, in the membrane. And here we have an uh, overlay of both uh, systems. So that means we have here at the outer phase, at the membrane phase, um, the rhodamin uh, system and inside the um, hydrophilic component. But we cannot only use um, small, uh, small molecules, but we can also use here uh, compartments like nanoscale systems. That means nanocapsules, for example, which are, are small compartments. So that means again here, the, um, what we create by microfluidics is, uh, um, uh, is here the polymerosome and inside the polymerosome, we have our small compartments. The small compartments we can get here as nano compartments um, by um, a so called mini emulsion process, where we have here in the um, 100 nanometer scale range our nano compartments, where we encapsulate, for example, enzymes, different kinds of enzymes. Um, and these different kinds of enzymes can be, be then trapped inside the polymerosomes by again using uh, microfluidics. And here we have here two kinds of um, uh, systems encapsulated, which uh, we can show here by the different colors. And in this case, we have really a cell-like bioreactor, which allows us to do cascade reactions. In this case, we can add amplex red and um, glucose, and then we have here the possibility to have a cascade reaction inside the polymerosome, uh, like we have that in the um, cell compartment. Maybe a different um, possibility, what we also can do is that we uh, can here form a coercivate um, inside. That means we start with a solution of um, polymer um, chains, and then we force them um, to come together inside the polymerosomes. So here it's uh, maybe a little bit better shown that we have here negatively and positively charged polymers. Um, and uh, then it's uh, first of all, uh, homogeneously distributed and only upon pH change or any other stimuli can we can um, put them together and have a very high concentration and therefore a, a possibility to get a certain reaction done. So and here you see that now inside the polymerosomes at high pH and at low pH at high pH is uh, con continuously um, uh, distributed inside the polymerosomes, whereas at a lower pH is really very um, uh, punctualized inside the um, inside the polymerosomes. And then we can get here. Oops, we can get here different kinds of. Um, uh, possibilities, what we can show here. First of all, homogeneous distribution. And here we have then 
again here the very um, punct. So, so here a point form uh, that we have here the quasar bit. So with this, I would like to stop my talk here in order to have enough um, possibility to discuss about that. But um, I would like to hand over to Joachim now to give his final talk. Joachim, please. Thank you, Katharina. Yeah, I'm seeing already this is gonna be a very nice discussion. Um, I will maybe add now a new angle to microfluidics. In fact, I will not only talk about microfluidics, but also about micro patterning and microstructuring. The reason is that we are interested in um, dynamics of living systems. So we'd like to work with cells. And of course, you can put a living cell into a fluidic device and look at them on the fly as they're going through fluidics. This is what Jochen Cook would have told you, uh, but he unfortunately couldn't join today. Uh, we like to look um, at cell behavior over time. So we have to put them on a chip, but make sure that we can change conditions and have a, a perfusion if that cells are, are happy. Yeah. Okay, so I think it's important to first point out what is the scientific agenda, and then we come to the technology, the microfluidics. Uh, I have a lot of backup slides for the discussion later on. I try to stay uh, short at the moment. So I'm interested in systems response. Yeah, How come that cells um, have a certain behavior, they move in a certain way? Um, they are programmed by genetic networks that we know can undergo shifts and changes in states of, of, of cell behavior. And in order to get access to, um, to their genetic network, uh, we like to use lipid nanoparticles. And you see them here on the left-hand side. Uh, these are lipid nanoparticles, which in my view are beautiful soft matter systems. Um, but you know them also as um, vaccination carriers. Yeah, so the uh, BioNTech and Moderna vaccines are lipid nanoparticles of, of such kind. And uh, you might know that the delivery of mRNA, but also other kinds of nucleic acid, like uh, small pieces of SI RNA or microRNAs, yeah, that delivery can be achieved by encapsulating nucleic acid with lipids, in particular cationic lipids, but also lipids that have a, a shielding effect, but you have to put them together in a right way. So you first of all design the molecules that they self-assemble into um, core shell structures, but there is a technical problem that these components have to be mixed rapidly. Yeah, So there is um, a, a mixing problem. Uh, you uh, have all the components dissolved in an alcohol phase, and you have to bring them into a water phase where they then very quickly self-assemble. But um, in order to get really nanoparticles, you need to have that uh, mixing done very fast. Uh, in our lab, we've been using microfluidics like uh, hydrodynamic focusing, so that in a controlled way, you can uh, control what we call solvent exchange. Yes, yeah? so the alcohol phase would be exchanged into a water phase um, in a controlled way. And if you do it on a chip, the dispersion or the, um, the, 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 the quality of the particle uh, ensemble is much better than if you do it by hand. Yeah? You know this is now becoming a pharmaceutical technology that is basically solved. You can scale it up uh, even with simple T-junctions. Um, however, there are still open questions in, uh, in mixing in general, especially if the components um, have different qualities. So it's not guaranteed that if you mix mRNA or plasmid or microRNAs, if they have the same mixing behavior with lipid as, as uh, uh, before. So it has to be redone all the time. But anyway, rapid mixing uh, to make nanoparticles is one topic. Now then we like to use these nanoparticles uh, to change cell behavior. So we transfect cells and then we watch how uh, circuits are switched and how um, cells undergo different behavior. So we need to have access or somehow, first of all, see how particles are getting in. And for this, we 
we do what's called in transfection assay. We place cells on the surface um, and transfect them with a reporter. So that's a, the, the gene of GFP and the cells turn green after time. So we do time-lapse microscopy in a, in a structured, um, on a structured platform. We call it a live cell imaging on single cell arrays. And this requires um, patterning, which uh, we, we have developed now various approaches to basically put adhesive islands down to a flat surface. So the, the first way to do it is to use um, a PDMS stamp uh, that protects certain areas. You then make the rest hydrophilic. You do sort of backfilling with PLL pack. Um, that will make an inert layer, and then you lift off the, the pattern and backfill with fibronectin. Yeah? So such a surface um, basically makes cells adhere to sites that you have created. Yeah? And that leads to cell sorting, that after some time you have an array of living cells, and the beauty is that they all have the same conditions, um, same area, um, same medium and everything. And now, we apply the lipid nanoparticles and watch transaction over time. And the point is that we like to very accurately see when does the onset of delivery happen. And for this, we need to control um, the incubation process. Yeah? So we do it all in situ under the microscope uh, with a perfusion system. You flow in uh, the particles for some time, and then you can rinse again after, uh, after some time. You, you, you can also let it on, stay on for a long time. But if you'd like to have a precise impact with a pulse, um, you need the microfluidic environment. And that, uh, okay, you can then see that the particles have different timing. So onset time and efficiency are, are correlated. Lipoplexes are different from uh, lipid nanoparticles. You, so you can see uh, how that so-called so protein corona uh, does make a difference. Yeah. Okay, so the final topic, is, uh, well, final topic is we'd like to measure cell behavior. So that means we'd like to observe how cells are migrating and for that, we are creating um, micro environments that are designed to probe a certain type of behavior. Like uh, here is a dumbbell that is uh, made to probe invasion. Yeah, uh, the other one is for polarization. Uh, and here are two cells on a dumbbell where we can measure cell cohesion. Or down here, you see a cell um, walking on a lane with different fibronectin concentrations. So you can see. Uh, how adhesiveness of cells uh, is working. Yeah? Okay, and the point is that microstructures help us to create arrays where cells undergo the same exercise and we get statistics. It means we do time lapse in a scanning mode. We scan over a large area and we typically collect hundreds, sometimes thousands of cells uh, in, in parallel. And that leaves you with many traces that you can analyze. In that sense, it is a, a time-lapse high throughput technique. Um, but of course, um, the quality of, of your surface is very important for the meaning of such tracks. Yeah? Okay, and, and you can ask, how do we make uh, surfaces like this? Uh, for that, there are, uh, okay, definitely you see differences here in the speed of the cells. So there's a lot of, say, interesting behavior on these microstructures. Um, for example, the so-called biphasic relation. So velocity increases with more adhesiveness. But then if it's, there's too much adhesion, uh, velocity goes down again. Uh, maybe I, I skip this. That's more of the biophysics. Now here comes the patterning technique. So the the easiest and maybe oldest technique for patterning is uh, micro contact printing. You basically make a stamp, you incubate with uh, the protein you want, and you stamp it by hand or maybe with some kind of mechanics control uh, onto a surface. More robust in our hands is photo patterning, uh, where you use a photo mask and UV light to um, launch a UV reaction and then typically like click chemistry to put RGD onto a defined area. Yeah. 
uh, even more advanced and especially more precise in terms of resolution is, is laser patterning. And that means you need an instrument with a sharp laser focus. And we have, um, yeah, I should, an instrument from Alveoli, Primo, yeah, where you can uh, basically excite UV light uh, on the spot. And in this case, you typically um, make a passive coating and then the laser is cuts away uh, the coating at defined area. So it's like a negative structuring technique and then you incubate with the ECM. Okay. Um, this is surface patterning. I'd like to quickly discuss how to go into three dimensions. Uh, for this, we use hydrogels. Um, the most known hydrogel is polyacrylamide. Yeah? But you might know that uh, acrylamides, they polymerize in a so-called chain growth mechanism, which is a little unordered. So you, you can yeah, control it. But if you look at the mesh size, it would be broadly distributed. And there is a way to make more controlled hydrogels by using, um, yeah, yeah, like PEC norbonin uh, is chemistry where you make something that has exactly four arms. And the reaction is an in thiol, re thiol in reaction, which is controlled. You have controlled valency and in the step growth mechanism basically leads to a fairly controlled hydrogel with defined mesh size. So that's nice yeah but what's also nice is that in these networks you now can add uh, peptides that have certain properties for example rgd sequences make cells uh, adhere uh, but there are also sequences that can be cleaved by metalloproteases so now we'd like to use the hydrogels as a matrix for cell migration and there the fact that the cells can cleave the network is important because otherwise they are trapped yeah um, you can also deform a hydrogel. Here is a uniaxial deformation applied, and you see them all run in one direction. Uh, and, and you can also now make hydrogels that are flat. Uh, and this is work by Stefan Stöberl, who now developed in our group a spacer technique of, of hydrogels combined with UV laser writing. So you, you make a slit, uh, fill it with hydrogel, and then you write a structure into it. And so we again write dumbbells, but these are now dumbbells that are 3D and they are labeled with beads. And as you see here, the beads are important because this is traction force in a microstructure. That's a nucleus uh, as it deforms as the cell is squeezing through the, the channel here. Yeah? And uh, the point is that we can do this now in parallel and see dynamics and, and force fields at the same time. So very quick, last chapter is uh, a very nice project that uh, is done by uh, Onokan as a group member of the Matter to Life project together with Karen Alim. And here again, we use the same hydrogel that I just introduced, uh, but we um, write pattern in, in a larger channel. So we you are writing our microfluidic network. Uh, the question that's asked here is, um, how can we make an adaptive microfluidics? And, and that is important because many media are disordered, like filter media, are porous materials with a, with a distribution of, of widths. And this heterogeneity typically worsens with time. And that's a problem if you'd like to use it as a filter or if you'd like to have defined properties. The question you can ask is, can you make a network that reacts in a way that it itself organizes becomes more homogeneous over time yeah? i think it's a very interesting question to ask and onochan is approaching this problem by saying let's use enzymes to change the the network over time you see here pillars that are eaten away uh, and we want to use this now to turn a heterogeneous network into a more homogeneous network and you see the flow profile here that is a flow of speed distribution Okay, the problem is not yet solved, but Karin has a theory where she believes that we can solve it using a pulse flow so that the degradation is controlled in a way that it's basically giving this positive feedback. Okay, so with this, I'd like to close. So first of all, we're interested to monitor living cells. I think living cells are the test tubes of the 21st century. That's a nice statement by John Widom. And secondly, uh, 
yeah, we, we put cells in confinement and uh, you have to always be careful. That might not be comfortable. You always interfere with the living system as shown here. I am very grateful to my group. This is our finally last our, yeah, workshop that we had outdoor again. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Joachim. So now we have uh, a couple of questions. Um, maybe um, I just um, give the word to Zara. Zara, um, you can read the questions as well, right? And uh, maybe we can just go to the first question. What kind of proteins did you uh, assess during using the droplets in the microfluidic channels? Yeah, so um, in that first example that I showed you where we put the, the networks in droplets, we were actually looking at Vimentin intermediate filaments. And also in the example where I showed you how we stretch filaments using the um, optical tweezers in a microfluidic device, we also looked at intermediate filaments because we were interested in, first of all, how they interact with each other. And secondly, how they mechanically react to, to, to stress and strain. And uh, I think the second part of your question, can you also use, for example, fiber forming peptides, which aggregate to fibers via hydrophobic interactions? Yes, exactly. That's, that's more or less what we did. In our case, it's an electrostatic interaction, but you could as well study hydrophobic interactions and maybe then in a combinatoric manner add some detergents and study the um, change of the hydrophobicity. Um, yeah, very well. I mean, you can, you can combine this with microscopy yeah. and you can watch um, your system evolving while you're mixing it in the droplets. And so that's exactly the idea. Yes, very, very good suggestions. Good question. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. So uh, the, uh, another question was uh, whether I could explain a bit more about the, oops, okay. A bit more about the factors influencing the vetting of um, organic solvents from double emulsions. Um, yeah, of course, it depends very much on the interfacial tensions uh, between the faces we are, um, we are talking about. And these are, of course, first of all, the interfacial tensions be between the pure solvent, if we just use pure full solvent, that means, for example, um, water and uh, we use in many cases oleyl alcohol, but of course, as well, um, we have still surfactants involved. And that, of course, also changes the uh, interfacial tension between the two faces. Um, and therefore, that is then uh, very crucial for the uh, devetting process. Another uh, question was, which is now in the chat, and uh, not in the um, Q&A, uh, uh, how long could a microfluidic chip be used? What is its typical lifetime. So uh, it's probably meant that this is the PDMS uh, microfluidic chip. Um, so it's it's very easy to um, it's very easy to do, to do the um, process, right? So we usually don't use the um, the chip for a long time. We change that in order to be sure that we don't have any. Um, uh, any rest or anything left inside the uh, the uh, microfluidic chips. So therefore, we tend to so we tend to use every day a new chip, or for every even for every experiment a new chip. So, but you could also if it's because it's so easy to get it and it's so easy to print it out, right? So it's not an issue. Uh, it's not an, uh, also not a cost issue in, usually, in most of the cases. But if if it is, so you can use it also several times. It's also not a problem. So there was now um, a question to, to Joachim. Mm -hmm. um, I just hand it over to you. Yeah, I, I, I read it here. How much hydrogel in milliliters do you require to fill your multiple chamber assay? OK, so first of all, we use um, basically plastic channels that are microscopic, like uh, I think five millimeters wide and several centimeters long. Um, it can be filled with one milliliter of hydrogel solution. And then you create the structure inside the channel. That's kind of the beauty. Then you wash out the material that is not polymerized and then you have a microfluidic structure. Um, 
Maybe I should point out that the hydrogel, um, so why do we take hydrogel and not PDMS? I mean, PDMS is the gold standard, Katharina, you know, said it, yeah, but um, hydrogel is, is diffusible, yeah? So if you look at the shear flow, you will see it can guide the flow. You can make a channel and it, the, the flow is con confined, but over longer time scale, like a dye would diffuse into the walls. And so there is some strengths to hydrogels. They can typically also be more easily turned hydrophilic. We've been working with immune cells in PDMS chips. It's sort of okay, but typically cells are always somehow responsive to solid surfaces. Yeah. PDMS is, is, a, is a, again, fairly biocompatible, but a, I think a PEG hydrogel should be even more biocompatible. And it, um, yeah, it has this other structure. So for us, um, I think the problem was to make these thin layers of hydrogels. Yeah? And yeah, Stefan solved it with, with spacers. And that, you know, material is not so, so big of an issue. It's not expensive. So um, <laughs> I don't know why you asked for the amount of material because, um, yeah, I think that was never an, an issue for us. I don't know if we can have the students also like to interact with us. Um, can they show up? If, uh, I can't make them visible, but I can let them speak. Mm. Um, you can let them speak. So if, if, yeah. uh, who was it? Um, if there are more questions, you can answer immediately. Yeah, yeah or you type it in uh, uh, if you like. So that, mm -hmm. uh, of course, it would be good to, if, uh, if they can speak up. It, I think it would be a little bit more lively. Okay, um, to do this, I, I can't tell that you want to speak um, by telepathy. You have to raise your electronic hand, not your physical hand. I can't see you. Um, if you raise your electronic hands, uh -huh, um, I should be able to allow you to speak. Ah, um, so I will allow Thomas to talk if that's okay. Should I do that? Yeah. Okay. You should be able to speak now. Yes. Do you hear me well? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yes. I was asking in particular. So thank you for this answer already. But I was asking for the for the amount of hydrogel because depending on what hydrogel you're synthesizing, it might be quite expensive, right? So if I think about, I don't know, a peptide-based hydrogel where you have a lot of synthesis cost, it might be relevant if we need like 10 milliliters or one milliliter. So it's interesting that you apparently don't need a lot of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, the channel is microscopic, but still small. Well, my, one milliliter is sort of in the in between, I guess. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I wouldn't call it micro, right? Thanks. But but actually, you. I mean, I think it's a good point. Uh, if we discuss microfluidics in industry, uh, microfluidics definitely can save cost. Yeah, because you can reduce the volume of reactions. Uh, you can manipulate cells that are pressures. I mean, there are some stem cells that basically each cell costs 10 or 100 euros, right? So then you, you can save cost by reducing volume. Okay, there's another question to Zara. Um, is it safe to say that microfluidics is a key way to create a model of blood capillary channel? Yeah, thank you for that question. So, I mean, in the end, um, microfluidics, if you look at the word, basically means that you have flows and fluids at micron scales. And that's exactly what you find in the, in the blood vessel system and especially in the small capillaries. Um, and after also seeing Joachim's talk with the soft walls of his channels, I mean, this comes even closer to um, what you find in a, in a biological system where, where the blood vessel walls are also a little bit deformable and elastic. And so, so yeah, I mean, if you really want to mimic blood flow, then microfluidics is probably the way to go. But you have to also keep in mind that blood is not a Newtonian fluid. So if you put that into your channel, things become much more complicated than what, what we told you today. Um, because you will have effects from, yeah, the um, shear, shear thinning, um, blood is full of particles, the blood cells, so that uh, could, you could actually treat them as, as, as colloids, and things become much more complicated. But, but yeah, I, I would say that um, if you really want to mimic in an experiment blood flow, then 
you you have to go micro and so then you are in the microfluidics regime yes very good suggestion oh, Joachim. Yeah, maybe you can also discuss here a little bit sarah i really like what you said um, i think it always depends on what you what you want yeah so we are not medical doctors so we do not want to make implants if you want to make a blood vessel implant for medicine that's a different issue yeah so we'd like to use microfluidics for biophysical studies okay if sarah needs high resolution the surface needs to be glass yeah if you want to mimic responsive materials and karin alim's interest was infective vascular networks i mean net, uh, so, so it can, exactly came from the idea of uh, of blood vessels um, and um, yeah, so so then you need need to to design different things. Yeah. And and I think there are many questions with blood vessels where you need to create epithelium. So you have to put a cell monolayer onto the surface to see what's going on in the blood vessel. Yeah, and and that again is is a different um, challenge. That's yeah, my take on this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this actually takes us then all the way to what people call organ on chip where they really try to mimic full organ systems on a microfluidic chip. Actually also with the purpose, as Joachim just said, not with the purpose to, to implant that organ on chip into a, a animal or human, but with the purpose to study um, processes that would normally occur in an animal on a microfluidic chip. And that has several advantages. I mean, first of all, um, of course, you don't need to use animals, which is a big issue and a discussion going on for 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 a long time already, and still valid. Um, but also, you you have very controlled properties and and conditions, and you can actually control your system much better than when you, for example, use a mouse model or something. And that's why people are, um, um, yeah, developing these kinds of organ on chip um, devices. So it's interesting. Here we have another question. Um, Maybe Sarah, you can uh, uh, also continue here. Speaking uh, of the lab on the ship, I just, um, so the, 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 the other question, I will, we will come to that later. And then Eppendorf tube on a very small scale. Now it's the DNA folding uh, protocol, right? So, but in principle, of course, it is also possible that we can uh, do um, uh, at the same time, uh, simultaneously then uh, the, uh, un the folding and unfolding processes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this this lab on a chip that that uh, Johannes Hamann here refers to. This is exactly what people have been working on, actually, for a long time already, um, and uh, really trying to use these very small volumes. So you can do a separate experiment in each each um, droplet, and then trying to mimic everything that you do in the lab, like heating and cooling mixing, separating, um, detection, all these kind of things. And um, yeah, I, th I think this is this is really a technology that I think Katharina, you refer to it in your talk. One problem is the upscaling for industrial purposes. That is still an issue actually. But for research purposes, yeah. there are lots of interesting applications, like for example, directed um, evolution where you look at certain mutations and then select for those um, in cells, for example, bacteria cells, and speed up processes that otherwise would take very long and would become also very expensive. So, yeah. Yeah, definitely. And then there was a question by Philip. Um, yes, you can change the material uh, that, so that it's transparent to, um, to, to different wavelengths, right? So it depends a little bit to which wavelength um, you're referring to, um, therefore you can choose the material to your to your wish, of course. Philip has his hand up. May I let him talk? Go ahead. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. we can. Yeah. Thanks a lot for the discussion. It was very interesting to me, especially since I have an appointment on Monday. Um, to have some microfluidic chips designed and made for me. And my current application is that I want to immobilize uh, certain cyanobacteria on it and then perform a couple of measurements with them. And for some of these measurements, I want to use, for example, fluorescent dyes. And there I thought it might be very helpful, especially if I have very specific uh, demands that if it is possible to modify the material to be only transparent in a certain wavelength range, it might enable me to not have to um, use 
uh, the very specific filter, because I mean, for each fluorescent assay, you need another filter. And if it's possible to basically already filter in the chip for these wavelength ranges by easy modifications, that would be great. I would think it's much easier to yeah, just use a filter, actually. Yeah, I would also. <laughs> I, I would also say because the modification of the material usually is more tedious to do, and uh, you have to figure out really how effective the filtering of the material then is um, at um, the certain thickness. And I would would also go. So that is would be my uh, advice. I would go for the filters as well. Yeah, I mean, there's a reason that when you, for example, buy a filter for your microscope, it costs between a few hundred and a thousand euros, because it's a very uh, complex um, optical device, actually, with uh, lots of steps to produce it. And if you want to use that kind of material, that's what you would need, right? I mean, you would need the filter material embedded as a window material in your device. That would make your device very expensive and also probably difficult to make. But in principle, I could maybe add that it is, of course, possible to, to produce um, devices out of many materials, and you can also mix materials. So, for example, something that I didn't show today is we also made materials for um, or devices for X-ray experiments in the past. And I think that Joachim also did that. Um, and then you use materials that are X-ray compatible, transparent to X-rays, not, not necessarily so much to visible light. And then you have to somehow just in a composite manner put them together. Um, that's not always easy, but that also works and there are lots of solutions out there. So if you, for example, have a certain method that doesn't go so well with the typical glass light that you attach to your PDMS and you need another material, silicon nitride or a certain plastic or um, Kapton or something like that, then um, look at the literature because it's very likely that someone has tried that before. Um, but but filtering one wavelength, I think it's easier when your microscope does that for you. Okay, thank you. Especially with the captain, that's very interesting. I'm gonna read into that since I'm also doing synchrotron experiments, and it might allow me to basically already fill on the uh, on the island where I collect my samples into a microfluidic captain system or something, and then just measure it a few weeks later. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, there are lots of, of X-ray compatible device types around. There are reviews about it. And if you need something, just contact me. I can also send you some material. Perfect. Do you have other questions? Ah, oh, there's another one. I'm just losing that. Regarding devetting of phospholipid, double emulsion droplets. Do you get rid of the entire organic solvent to produce actually vesicles or does devetting just reduce the organic phase? So I think that's a question to, to us. Um, so actually in our case, if we use really, so in most cases we use um, alcohols which allows, which allows us really to get entirely rid of the alcohols. So that is what we want to have and otherwise, um, we would have artifacts in our measurements immediately. Therefore, we check carefully that all the alcohol is really um, gone uh, before we start um, the, um, uh, the experiment, the further experiments. So therefore, we get really entirely rid of the organic salt in this case. Okay. So now we have the possibility to answer the last questions. Uh, if you uh, still have some questions, we are happy to, to discuss on them. You, you ask very specific questions. You can broaden the questions, <laughs> what, the, what the future will bring maybe. From... That I can also ask to Sarah, where do you see, the, <laughs> where do we go? Oh yeah, sure, uh, Joachim, it's also allowed that you ask the question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure why you ask me, Joachim, because I would say what, the stuff that you do is actually super exciting with the, um, with the uh, soft materials, uh, at least for cell research. I think that that's really a very interesting approach to have soft walls in your devices, that, that's really cool. 
And then, I mean, I, I have to admit that so during my postdoc, I did a lot of the stuff that uh, Katarina showed. Um, and I, I still remember how these uh, double and triple emulsions were, were made in, in Dave Waits' lab at the time. But I kind of lost a little bit the overview of what's going on there at the moment. But I think now you're much further with like using these droplets and yeah, using this, them as compartments, but also for synthetic cell approaches, like trying to build up uh, cell from scratch. This is this also a topic that we didn't touch so much today. Mm -hmm. So it, it's really broadening now, I think. I really lots of different applications. Yeah, and also the combination of um, compartments, right, to put inside there. I think that is, so when, actually when we started that, so we thought, okay, it's so easy to put several compartments inside uh, a vesicle structure, um, but it is not to have, if we really want to have pure water inside. So the beginning was that um, the microfluidics was only possible if you had sucrose inside at a certain amount and that would uh, would have killed our entire reaction and the stability and would, decrease, would have decreased the stability of our collets. But now it is really possible to, to introduce all kinds of collets and not only molecules, but collets in there uh, which keep them stable and you have an, um, yeah, an environment inside the um, the polymerosomes, uh, which is basically water. I'm going to jump in quickly because I can see that people are having to head off and very quickly advertise that the next one of these is on the 13th of July. And now I will hand back to continue the discussions, but I don't want people to miss the next one if you need to leave at any point. But if you wish to stay and continue, you're very welcome. Commercial break over. Yeah. <laughs> Do we know what the topic for the next one is, Anne? It's on ethics of matter to life. Okay. Okay. I see. Yeah. So, but I, I just want to pick up on what uh, Sarah said. I think um, the idea of a discussion here is that, that we present what is there as a technology. And, you know, I invite every student to use it and make combinations out of it. As Katharina said, you. You can take a micro droplet and put a living cell into there and then take a tweezer like Sarah and, and ask questions on biomechanics. I think the technology is not, is not limiting really. Everything can be done. It is not easy. I, I, it typically takes some time, like half a year or a year sometimes to get the expertise on all, all the little details. Yeah, Microfluidics needs say a steady hand and careful preparation and all this. But I think the bigger question in science is always like, you know, what do you want to do? What, what is important um, the research question? Absolutely. Um, and so from my side, if anybody um, has ideas now and needs some technology that uh, I presented, uh, just contact me. Mm. Yeah. So thank you very much. Um, and I think uh, if there are no further questions, I would like to really thank everybody for um, the contribution. So especially, of course, Sarah and Joachim for their talks and you all for the uh, questions and the discussion, great discussion. And I would like to hand over to Anne now. Okay. Thank you, and sorry for jumping in towards the end, but I could see our number of participants declining steeply and I wanted to catch them before they disappeared. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you to Katrina Landfester for chairing and for moderating this. Thank you very much to Sarah for her spontaneous jumping in um, when we hit, got hit by gremlins and to Joachim for a, such an interesting presentation. Um, and I really love yourselves jumping between the two <laughs> islands. I think they're just brilliant. Mm -hmm. um, so. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this new discussion format and I hope you'll join us again on July the 13th um, where we'll be coming live from Ringberg um, and it will be a discussion on the ethics involved in doing these kind of systems. So thank you all very much. <laughs>